Hey everybody, welcome to another online Wednesday night Bible study here at First Baptist Church of Van. I'm so glad that you're joining with us, whether you're one of our church members or whether you're just clicking on this link and you're maybe a part of another church or, or you're looking for a church home. I'm so glad that you came to join us tonight, whether you're on Facebook or, or YouTube or on our church website. I'm so glad that you came to connect with us as we study and get equipped with the tools that we need to open God's Word and accurately interpret it and understand it. So we're continuing our series tonight called Meet My Friend Herman. Hopefully, if you've been with us now for the, the first four weeks of this series, you've got a firm grasp on who Herman is. But if you're just jumping in for the first time tonight, Herman is short for hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the word that we use to describe the the, the process of how we understand and interpret the Word of God. So we believe, here at First Baptist Church, we believe that the Word is true, it's infallible, it's without error, and it's inspired by God Himself. It tells us everything that we need to know about God and about how He redeems His people. So knowing that, it is so important for us, knowing that the Word is inspired, that it's perfect, that it's inerrant, that it, it has everything that we need. Knowing that, it's so important for us to use the tools of hermeneutics to accurately determine what God is saying in his word and to, to faithfully apply it to our hearts and lives. We cannot just pull a verse out of context. We can't just take a verse that we like and pull it out of context, put it on a frame or frame it and put it on our wall and say, well, that's my, that's my new life verse. What happens when we do that? is that a lot of the times we're not correctly interpreting what God is trying to say. And a lot of times we're making him say, we're making the Bible say something that it was not intended to say. In fact, tonight we're going to look at the prophecy, the section of scripture we call the prophecy. And included in the prophecy is probably one of the verses that is taken out of context more than any other verse. And that's Jeremiah 29, 11. I love that verse, but I love that verse grounded in context. Context is king. And what hermeneutics does is it helps us to understand the context of scripture, helps us to understand accurately and faithfully what God is saying to his people. And so we're going we're gonna to use these tools of hermeneutics. We're going to ask our new friend Herman to help us understand some of these things that we encounter in scripture. So each week of this series, we've been looking at a different section of scripture. We've looked at the, the, the law, the history, the poetry. We're going to look at tonight the prophecy. Next week, we'll see the gospels. And then after that, the letters. And so there's different sections of scripture. And so what we do as Bible students, all of us are Bible students, whether you know it or not, we are all students. And, and as followers of Christ, we're students of his word. So what we're going to do is go to our friend Herman and ask him to help us rightly and accurately understand what he is saying and how we are supposed to interpret each of these sections. Because you can't interpret poetry the same way that you interpret history. There are two different genres and we need to understand the tools and the framework in each section. So when we go to God's word in the future... Every time that we'll be able to open it, I'm going to try and I'm trying here to give you the tools so that when you open God's word, you can say, I know what that means. I know how to how to find or, or if I don't know how it means, I know how to find out. I can look at this passage and I can ask the right questions. I can go to the right resources. I can do what I need to do to be faithful in how I search out the scriptures. So tonight we're going to ask Herman to help us understand and interpret the Old Testament prophecy. The Old Testament prophecy. So the section of scripture we, we know as the prophecy stretches from the book of Isaiah all the way to the book of Malachi at the end of the Old Testament. It's usually split up into two major sections. The major prophets, which are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then the minor prophets, which include Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So when, when we say major versus minor, we're not talking about their importance. We're not talking about one, one is important and one is less important. We're talking really about their length. The minor prophets tend to be shorter than, than the books of the major prophets. And so the Old Testament prophecy, it, it covers 
hundreds of years. The timeline is really, really extensive. It's all the way from Joel, who we believe was probably the first prophet to write. And he wrote, he was probably a contemporary of Elisha. He was writing about 853 BC. I know that's a long time ago. And so that was kind of the start of it, all the way through the the book of Malachi, the prophet Malachi, who prophesied about 430 BC after the exiles returned to Jerusalem. So that that means there's 16 men here were prophesying over the span of 400 years. That's That's a huge chunk of real estate in history. But the prophetic books, they deal with so many different topics. Obviously, I I could spend, I mean, I could probably spend the rest of my life preaching through the books of prophecy because you, you know the longer books like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel would take years and years and years just to walk through verse by verse. But they deal with so many different topics. They tend to be very heavily focused on judgment and destruction. And that's not just because the Old Testament is scary and violent and God wants everybody to live in fear. No, they they kind of tend to focus on judgment because God is sending these prophets as messengers of warning to wicked and wayward people. He's sending the prophets to let them know if you don't turn away from your sins, if you don't repent from from those sins that you're committing, that lifestyle that you're living in, then there is going to be judgment coming. But it also, the prophets also talk about sin, personal responsibility, idolatry, the sovereignty of God. There's a lot of theology here. It talks about the fate of the wicked. Uh, it talks about the end of the world. It talks about the coming of the future Messiah. It talks about the destiny, the ultimate destiny of Israel. There's a lot of topics that, that are covered here in these 16 books. There's a lot of genres represented as well. We see in parts of Jeremiah, there's history, there's narrative, like we actually get to see some stories, but then also parts of Ezekiel are so symbolic. They're so full of metaphors that if you interpreted it literally, you would come up with some really crazy theology. And so there's, there's a lot of different things. We have to keep all of these things in mind as we read through the books of the, the prophets. What's more important than ever as you, as you read through the prophets is to determine context and genre. Those are the most important things. When you look at especially these books of the prophecies, we, we have to look and say, when is this happening? When is the context of this? And then in terms of genre, is this to be interpreted literally? Is this history? What, what piece of, of literature is this? That's how we're going to understand these faithfully. and and interpret them accurately. If you want an in-depth book, if you really want to see what this looks like, an in-depth look at one of the books of prophecy, I'm teaching through the book of Ezekiel right now on Sunday nights. I would love for you to join in with us Sunday nights at 6.30 p.m. on Facebook and YouTube and on our church website. I would love for you to interact with us, to engage with us, to follow through that. that. That'll kind of show practically what this looks like as you walk through one book of the Bible. So hopefully, um, if you you do that, that'll help you dive into the books of prophecy. But tonight, obviously, I can't cover all of the books of prophecy. It's not not possible. So what I want to give you is overview. So we're going to look at things from a bird's eye view instead of a worm's eye view, right? We want to see the whole forest instead of each individual tree. And what we're going to do, how we're going to do that is that we're going to look at a a passage in Scripture that's going to give us a broad overview of prophecy as a whole. So we're going to look at the shortest book in the Old Testament, the, the book of the prophet Obadiah. So I'm going to give you some time. I know that it's not an easy book to find as you look through your Bible, So, but go, go try to find that, the book of Obadiah. It's very, very short. It may be on just one or two pages in your Bible, just 21 verses, but it is ferocious. It's a great example for us tonight of Old Testament prophecy. It includes all, all, of the, the, all of the things that we need to see about prophecy. Immediate prophecy, it includes apocalyptic prophecy, which means talking about the end of the world. It, it references a future Messiah. It contains historical data. It is all here. Everything is it's kind of encapsulated in 21 verses. So hopefully I've given you enough time uh, to to search uh, through here. It's between the books of Amos and Jonah. So if you've reached Jonah and the whale, you've gone too far. And so uh, go back a little bit as you search for this, this book of Obadiah. So as prophets go, we know very, very little about this man, Obadiah. In fact, we're not even sure if Obadiah is even his name or if it's some kind of title because the word Obadiah means one who worships God. 
There, there are at least 12 people in the Bible named Obadiah, so that's not helpful at all in helping us determine because it could be any of them, it could be none of them. It, it was obviously a very common name in this time, or it could re refer to a title that, that it's just a, a worshiper uh, of the Lord. There's no agreement among, among Bible scholars about who this guy is. There's also no agreement about when this was written. There are some that contend it was written really early. There are some that contend it was written very late. And so we're not going to be dogmatic about any of that. Those details are kind of irrelevant. The message, the content of Obadiah is what I really want to want, want to talk through tonight. So Obadiah basically has, I love that word, it just kind of flows off. Obadiah, Obadiah. Obadiah has one major theme, and that's judgment against the nation of Edom. Judgment against the nation of Edom. So Joseph Parker he was a preacher in the 1800s in England, one of my favorite authors, and he wrote this. This prophecy is short, but terrible in its fullness. It is a single shout, but the cry rends the rocks of Edom. So he was really poetic in how he was describing that. This is a prophecy of judgment. Now, Edom, so let's, let's kind of talk about geography a little bit. There's Israel, and then right next to it is this nation of Edom, and they have a long and complicated history in Scripture. So Jacob and Esau, going all the way back to the book of Genesis, Jacob and Esau were twins. They were fighting in the womb, and they fought even throughout their entire life. There was a lifelong rivalry between these two brothers. You remember some of the stories where Jacob tricked Esau into giving him his birthright, and then Esau, again, Jacob tri tricked him into receiving the blessing from their father and Esau promised to kill Jacob so Jacob flees and there's this lifelong conflict and rivalry between these two brothers and it wasn't helped by their parents who each chose their favorites and then kind of pitted them against each other so there was kind of this 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 rivalry between them this bitterness that Esau held for his brother Jacob now both of these people both of these men Jacob and Esau were fathers of, the, of nations. Jacob was the father of Israel. In fact, his name literally becomes Israel later on in the story. But Esau was the father of this people group called Edom. And again, he's also called uh, Edom in the scripture. So his hatred for his brother was planted like a seed in the hearts of his ancestors. So for years, Edom and Israel were, were at war with one another. Now, God had commanded the people of Israel not to hate the people of Edom. Look at this in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 7. It says, do not despise the Edomite because he is your brother. So they, were, they weren't supposed to hate them. They were supposed to realize that they were brothers. But Edom never got that message because in Ezekiel 35, 5, it says that Edom maintained a personal hatred against his brother Israel. And then in Amos 1.11, it says, Edom pursued his brother with the sword. He stifled his compassion. His anger tore at him continually, and he harbored his rage incessantly. So that's the context of Obadiah writing these words. Edom and Israel have been in this bitter conflict for hundreds of years. Now, though, through the words of this prophet, Edom has come to their day of reckoning. There's, there's the day, finally, when the evil that they have done is going to come back on their head. So let's read the entire book of Obadiah together. It's just 21 verses. In fact, there are no chapters. It's just Obadiah verses 1 through 21. Let's read this together. It says this, The vision of Obadiah. This is what the Lord God has said about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy has been sent among the nations. Rise up and let us go to war against her, against Edom. Look, I will make you insignificant among the nations. You will be deeply despised. Your arrogant heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in your home on the heights, who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you seem to soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, even from there I will bring you down. This is the Lord's declaration. If thieves came to you, if marauders came by night, how ravaged you would be. But wouldn't they only steal what they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, wouldn't they, glean, wouldn't they leave some grapes? How Esau will be pillaged, though, his hidden treasures searched out. Everyone who has a treaty with you will drive you to the border. Everyone at peace with you will deceive and conquer you. Those who... 
eat your bread will set a trap for you. He will be unaware of it. In that day, this is the Lord's declaration, will I not eliminate the wise ones of Edom and those who understand from the hill country of Esau? Teman, your warriors will be terrified so that everyone from the hill country of Esau will be destroyed by slaughter. Verse 10, you will be covered with shame and destroyed forever because of the violence done to your brother Jacob. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers captured his wealth, while foreigners entered his city gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were just like one of them. Do not gloat over your brother in the day of his calamity. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction. Do not boastfully mock in the day of distress. Do not enter my people's city gate in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their misery in the day of their disaster. And do not appropriate their their possessions in the day of disaster. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off their fugitives. And do not hand over their survivors in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near against all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. What you deserve will return on your own head. As you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and gulp down and be as though they had never been. But there will be deliverance on Mount Zion, and it will be holy. The house of Jacob will dispossess those who dispossessed them. Then the house of Jacob will be a blazing fire, and the house of Joseph a burning flame. But the house of Esau will be stubble. Jacob will set them on fire and consume Edom. Therefore, no survivor will remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. People from the Negev will possess the hill country of Esau. Those from the Judean foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will possess the territories of Ephraim and Samaria, while Benjamin will possess Gilead. The exiles of the Israelites who are in Hala and who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, as well as the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad, will possess the cities of the Negev. Saviors will ascend Mount Zion to rule over the hill country of Esau, but the kingdom will be the Lord's. Okay, let's, let's pray as we dive into this passage. I know there's a lot here. My goal is not tonight to walk through every single one of these verses. Again, I'm trying to give overview of this entire section, so we're going to walk very quickly uh, through this. Father, thank you for this book. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it instructs us. It convicts us. It teaches us but it also corrects us. Lord, it's a living book. It's a living word that cuts us deep, deep into the soul, and it exposes who we really are. It exposes our sin, and it elevates your holiness, and that's what I want to see tonight, that you are sovereign, that you are good, that you are holy and righteous, and that you deserve our praise tonight. Thank you, Lord, that we read this word not through the lens of judgment, but through the lens of grace in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this opportunity we have to study your word. I pray that it would be fruitful and beneficial for us tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Okay, so hopefully you were following with me in this book of Obadiah. I know that it seems like a lot of things. It is kind of a big passage to read through, but it actually has a very, very simple outline. So the first nine verses talk about what God is going to do to Edom. This is directly to Edom. This is what is going to happen to these people. Then verses 10 through 16 talk about why. Why is God doing this to the people of Edom? And then the last section in verses 17 through 21, it talks about why this is important for the people of Israel. Kind of switches focus and gives this as, as, a, as an encouragement to the people of Israel. Okay, so what is God going to do? What is God going to do to Edom? He makes it very clear through this section. Verse 1 says, We have heard a message, the nations have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us go to war against her. So this is ultimately what's going to happen. What is God going to do? He's going to set nations against Edom. There's going to be war that comes to Edom. In verses Uh, two through four, we see that God is going to punish them for their pride. He he says in verse two, uh, or in verse three, I'm sorry, your arrogant heart has deceived you. So he's attacking their pride. In verses five and uh, in verses two through four, that's their pride. In verses five through six, he says he's going to strip away their wealth. 
all the wealth that they've collected, all the power and prestige that they have. In verse 7, he's going to turn their allies against him. Uh, it says, everyone who has a treaty with you will drive you to the border. Everyone at peace with you will deceive you and conquer you. So God is kind of reaching down into this situation. He's taking everything away. He's taking away their pride. He's taking away their wealth. He's taking away their allies. Uh, then we see that he destroys their knowledge in verse 8. All the wise men of, of Edom are going to be taken away. So he takes away their wisdom. And then in verse 9, he destroys their armies. He said in verse 9, Taman, your warriors will be terrified so that everyone from the hill country of Esau will be destroyed. And so that's what's going to happen. This is total and utter destruction. But why? Why is he doing all this? Like he, he's got to have a reason for utterly destroying this nation. And he outlines that in verses 10 through 16. He says uh, here in verse, verses 10 and 11, uh, he's doing this because of the violence they did to their brother uh, Jacob, their, their brother Israel. He says in verse 10, you'll be covered in shame and destroyed forever because of the violence done to your brother Jacob. He said, you did what was wrong. He, he was your brother. You should not have treated him this way. So that's verses 10 and 11. Uh, also, because they rejoiced when an enemy came in and conquered so when an enemy came in and conquered Jerusalem in verses 11 and 12, the, the people of Edom rejoiced. They're like, finally, someone's doing what was supposed to be done. So God's punishing them because of that. Also, in verses 13 and 14, it says that Edom actively assisted Israel's enemies in, in destroying them and fighting against them. And then finally, in verses 15 and 16, they, they, they are destroyed here because they ignored God's messages. They ignored God's warnings of his coming wrath. So this is the why. We've seen this is what God is going to do. This is why God has done it. They have completely disregarded the Lord. They have set their hearts against Israel and against the Lord, and now they're facing the consequences because of this. Obviously, this is a terrible message to have to give. Out of all the things, like out of all the, the, the times that I've had the privilege of standing and preaching and proclaiming God's word, I, I always carry that kind of in my heart that part of, part of the message that we preach, part of the gospel message is, is that there is judgment coming against the people who have set their hearts against the Lord, against sinners who have not repented. And that's a, that's a weighty thing. I understand Obadiah and, his, and what he must be feeling in this moment to cry out to a, a sinful people. There is judgment coming. But this is part of the message. There is judgment coming for, for sinners. But there is grace and mercy available through Jesus Christ. So this is kind of a, a tough message for Obadiah to have to give. This is a message of wrath, of judgment, of persecution and, and penalty and pain and destruction. But God says this, I mean, the whole reason behind this, he says, as you have done, it will be done to you. You know, as I was reading through that, what it sounded like to me, that kind of sounds like the flip side of the golden rule. You remember the golden rule that Jesus said? Whatever you want done to you, or whatever you want others to do to you, do unto others. I'm, I'm kind of butchering that. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, the flip side of this we see here. As you have done, so it will be done to you. The things that you have done to others now are going to come back onto your head. In Galatians, the Apostle Paul wrote it like this. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, that will he also reap. And so we've seen this. Edom has sown violence and hatred, and now they're reaping destruction and judgment. But here's the hope for the people of Israel. Remember the outline is what God is going to do to Edom, why God is doing it to Edom, and then why is this encouragement and hope for the people of Israel? Because of Edom's downfall, we see Israel gain victory. He says, your enemies are going to be destroyed. You're going to possess these lands. One day you, you will stand in the lands that Edom once inhabited and they will be yours, Israel. Obadiah says that Israel will reign over this and then ultimately God will reign over all things. So that's the book of Obadiah, all right? That's really all I want to walk through as we look at this book. It's a very, very simple story here. It's judgment against these people in Edom. But let's, let's talk a little bit about how this fits into the Old Testament prophecy as a whole. And then we're going to look at some of the common themes across all of the prophecy that show up here. So the book starts like this, the vision of 
Obadiah, the vision of Obadiah, okay? So God is saying, I literally gave Obadiah this vision. I let him see what was about to happen to the people of Edom. This is really, really common. The books of Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, and Habakkuk all start in an exactly that same way. The vision of dot, 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 whoever the, the author is. So he also continues and he says, we have, uh, this is what the Lord God has said. And then he says later on um, in verse 4, This is the Lord's declaration. We see that again in verse 8. This is the Lord's declaration. So what we're seeing here is Obadiah saying, I'm not not just bringing my own words. This is not like a commentary on, on my nation and on the political movements of what's happening. This is not a sermon against the people of Edom. These are God's actual words. God physically put, or spiritually, I guess, put these words in Obadiah's mouth and he said them. He wrote them. We see this in, in the book of, in, in the, the writings of Peter. He says that holy men of old, moved by the Holy Spirit, and inspired by God, wrote these things down. So God gave this prophecy. This is, this is him repeating God's words. They, the prophets as a whole, that's what they were sent to do, is to take a message from the Lord and deliver it exactly as it was spoken to the people. They were saying what God had told them to say. That's, that's exactly the role of a prophet. It's not to comment on it. It's not to say, and I agree with it, and I also think this should happen. This, this is the role of the prophet is just to say, This is what God has said. There is judgment coming, and you need to be ready. You need to be prepared for that. How are you preparing for for that moment? And and I'll ask you that same question. We know that there's judgment coming against the enemies of God. So how are you preparing for that moment? In in that day when we stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, what is going to be your defense? How will you stand before that that King? And what, What defense will you give? Because if you give anything else but that Jesus is your Savior, then you've got no hope. But if you look at him and say, I believe in Jesus, I, I, have, I have put my faith and trust in the name of Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord, and I have followed him, then he will be your defense. He'll be your advocate in that day of wrath that we see here. So, so prepare yourself for that day. Prepare your soul. We, we make all kinds of commitments. We, can, we make all kinds of decisions. We prepare ourselves financially, right? We, we invest and we do retirement. We invest in retirement and we, we kind of put all of these things against that day when we'll need uh, some, some rescue. But then a lot of times we ignore the things of the Lord. And that's the most important thing that you're ever going to prepare for or invest in is your position, your soul before a holy God. So we see that here that the, the prophets are, are uttering God's words, the vision of Obadiah. This is what the Lord has said. Another theme that comes up here in the book that is so important in the overarching story of scripture is what it says in verse 15. It says, for the day of the Lord is near. The day of the Lord is near against all the nations. Now that's talking about something that's going to happen at the end of all things. He's talking apocalyptic now. He's talking about the book of Revelation. The day of the Lord is a phrase that describes the end of the world when God is going to pour out his holy wrath on sin He's going to judge the nations, and he is going to establish his kingdom forever. So we read about this day of the Lord prophesied in seven of the books of the prophets, five of the books of the New Testament, and then we see it finally all come out in the book of Revelation in the New Testament. And we will talk about the, the, how to interpret the book of Revelation later in this series. But Obadiah is reminding the people of Edom that their destruction, their immediate destruction, is just a taste of what's going to happen one day. When all the nations are judged and all sin is destroyed and God casts Satan out of this earth and he rules this this world in power and glory and wisdom and majesty. He's talking uh, them in the long term. He's saying one day everyone will be judged. So we see here in Obadiah, I I love that we can see this kind of played out in the text, a short term prophecy that's fulfilled within a few years and then a long term prophecy that we're still waiting at this moment, for Christ to come back and fulfill uh, this, some, of these, some of these predictions and prophecies of the day of the Lord. Finally, I want to focus in on the last verse of Obadiah. I'm trying to connect it to all the other books of the prophecy. It says here in verse 21, Saviors will ascend Mount Zion to rule over the hill country of Esau, but the kingdom will be the Lord's. The kingdom will be the Lord's. 
Okay, this is messianic prophecy. This is talking about Jesus, King Jesus. Now, he's not talking about when Jesus would come in human form, be born of the Virgin Mary, live 33 years, and then die on a cross. He's not talking about that messianic prophecy. He's talking about a prophecy of Jesus' second coming. The, the time when he will come not as a meek and lowly lamb, but he'll come as the conquering king, riding on a white horse with his robes dipped in blood and, and fire in his eyes and a sword coming from his mouth, and he comes to judge the nations. That's what he's talking about. One day, the kingdom will be the Lord's. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. And, and so that's what he's talking about there, that one day, in, 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 our, in our eschatology is what we call it, in our, in our belief, in our theology about end times, that that's going to be the day. So I believe that right here we're reading about this in Obadiah. This is a prophecy of the millennial reign of Christ. So after he comes back and destroys Satan or, or binds Satan and destroys the armies of the Antichrist and sets up his rule and reign, he'll reign on this current earth for a thousand years. I believe that it's a literal thousand years, and we'll talk about that uh, in our study of, of Revelation. But after that moment, he will destroy all of our creation and recreate what he mentions in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, that he's going to recreate this world in a perfect way as it was intended to be. And so that's what we're going to see. So I believe this is messianic pro prophecy right here. It, this Obadiah is a very short book among the prophetic books, but it includes so many of the themes, so much of the genres, so much of, of what we see in the rest of, of the prophecy, all the way from Isaiah to Malachi. But what does this section as a whole, what does it teach us? Like, what does this mean for me? It, it teaches us a couple of lessons. Number one, God is sovereign. I want to push that into us. I want us to really firmly grasp that. As you see, as he's talking to Edom here in this passage in Obadiah, he makes it clear. He says, the Lord is the one who is in charge of all this. The Lord is the one bringing this disaster on you. The Lord is inciting the nations around you to go to war against you. God is in control. He is ruling and reigning and sovereign over all of his creation. No matter, he's telling them, no matter how strong you are, no matter how much wealth your leaders have, no matter how powerful and capable your armies are, nothing can stand against the Lord God Almighty. He is sovereign, he is ruling, and he is reigning. The prophetic books also show us, this whole section kind of shows us, kind of shows us that, that God will judge sin. It's an important theme in scripture. If you don't understand rightly that sin is, is a death sentence and needs to be judged, then we're not going to rightly understand the value and, and the, the infinite worth of the blood of Jesus that gives us rescue from all of that. So we see that God judges sin. He must. He's holy and righteous and he's working to redeem a people for himself. He is perfectly just and wrathful, but he also provides mercy for those who come to him in faith. So the prophetic books also show us this idea that there will be a, a, a redeemer, a Messiah who will come. And we see this obviously very clearly outlined in the book of Isaiah chapter 53. But we see this, this idea that uh, he, he rescues his people from destruction. He rescued Israel or Judah from exile. And it's a picture of that, that he will one day rescue his people from destruction through the blood of Jesus. He conquers our enemies. Whoa, I almost knocked that down. He conquers our enemies through his victory on the cross. So the books of prophecy, they, they also show us the end of the story. They're situated toward the beginning of the story, but they also show us the end of the story. They, they show us that God will win, that Jesus will have victory, that at the end of all things, Satan is not going to win. He knows that his time is short. But God will have ultimate victory. He will rule and reign over his creation forever. The books of prophecy, what they should do for us, as we read Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and, and Obadiah, Micah, Nahum, Hosea, we read Zephaniah and Malachi, we read all these books, what they should do is they should draw our hearts to God in worship, that he is sovereign, he is worthy of all our worship and praise. They should also help us to set our eyes firmly on the coming day of the Lord, that we should look and long for the moment that Jesus comes and rescues and raptures his church. Obadiah should draw us to long for the return of our king. So as you read the, the books of the prophecy in your own study, remember 
to ask our friend Herman the four questions of interpretation here. Number one, what genre is this? This is so important as you read through Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the way to Malachi. Ask, ask Herman that question. What genre is this? Is this poetry? Because we need to understand then that it probably includes symbolism and metaphors and hyperbole. We got to understand it figuratively. If it's including a story or a narrative, then we have to understand it literally, that this actually happened. So ask, ask Herman that question. Is it, what genre is this? Number two, what is the context? Where does this fit? Look for those clues. Find out where this fits. Is this before the exile? Is this after the exile? Where is it during the exile? Because some of them, uh, like we read uh, about Jeremiah, he writes before and during the exile, but then we read about Ezekiel. He's, he's, the exile has already happened and he's there in Babylon. Same thing with Daniel. And so we have to understand the context of when this is happening. Number three, and that leads us to, to this, how does it fit into the big picture? Is this a lesson on judgment? Is that, is that how it is going to fit into the big picture? Is this for Israel or is this for another nation? Because if it's for Israel, then we know in the big picture, Israel will eventually see their Messiah and come to faith in Jesus Christ, or at least a remnant of them will in, at the end of all things. So as, as you search for context, it also determines how this fits into the big picture. And then number four, how does this point me to Jesus? How does this point me to Jesus? Some passages are really easy. You open up Isaiah 53. I've mentioned that a few times. I encourage you to read it tonight. It's, it's very easy. It connects right to Jesus. It is describing Jesus word for word. But some places like what we read in Obadiah, you've got to look for it. You've got to find uh, those 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 gospel parallels, and you've got to find it there. Uh, you got to drive down those avenues and find out where it connects to the text. So we do see, though, in Obadiah that Jesus will sit on his glorious eternal throne. The kingdom will be his. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? He will sit on that eternal throne, and that's what Obadiah is, is pointing us to in the person of Jesus. But use Herman. Utilize your friend Herman. That's, that's the way that we understand, rightly understand, and accurately interpret God's word is when we use these terms. To tools, turtles, yeah, okay. You're going too long, Pastor Mark. You need to end. <laughs> we use these tools of hermeneutics to help us understand God's word. Use Herman. If you ever have questions, please, please contact us. Oh man, I would love to sit down in the books of prophecy and, and help you understand what it means, uh, what, what, this, what it means, how we interpret this and how it applies into our lives. Message us, call me, call the church. I would love to spend that time with you as we learn how to faithfully understand and obey God's word. Let me, I'm gonna pray for us tonight. And what I wanna do, I wanna do a special prayer for us. John Calvin, in his commentary of, of Obadiah, he included this prayer that he wrote after reading and studying the book of Obadiah. I want to read his prayer. I think it's beautiful, and I think it's very appropriate for not just where he was, not just where Obadiah was, but also where, where we are as a nation today. So if, we, if you'd allow me to do that, I'm going to read his prayer, and then we'll be done. Grant, Almighty God, that as thou seest us to be on every side at this day, beset by so many enemies, even by those who constantly devise means to destroy us, while we are so very weak and feeble, O oh, grant, my Lord, that we may learn to look up to Thee, and that our trust may rest on Thee so that however exposed we may be to all kinds of danger, according to what appears to the flesh, we may not yet doubt, but that thou art ever armed with sufficient power to terrify our enemies, so that we may quietly live amidst all dangers and never cease to call on thy name, as thou hast promised to be sure and faithful defender of our safety in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My prayer this week is that you would be blessed. And as you pick up these tools and you pick up God's word and you understand it accurately and obey it faithfully, that we would draw our hearts nearer and nearer to our Savior. You guys have a fantastic week. God bless.